Welcome, everybody. Uh, today is our, I forgot, I think 33rd. 33. 33. That's amazing. In Germany, we call those Schnapszahl. So this is a number where you would have to take a uh, take a drink. <laughs> We're not doing that today, so we'll maybe defer that to the ne uh, next life coding happy hour. We can we can raise a glass with whatever non alcoholic beverage. Anyways, uh, welcome everybody. It is release time, and it's so exciting. I am uh, so glad everybody is here. Uh, today in our 33rd uh, session for the now uh, for this platform academy um, I welcome two of my colleagues from the pro uh, product success team we've already had Jared on the show John Lind is our uh, newest addition to the uh, speakers and my colleague Eliza will help answer questions in chat and in the Q&A panel uh, today we will speak about hi Eliza <laughs> it's so good to see you uh, today, we will go through new features on the NOW platform in the Utah release. Utah went uh, uh, GA, that is general availability, uh, last week. We're very excited to bring these new features to you. Um, before we head into this, um, there have been a lot of great uh, videos, blogs, content by our colleagues into the developer advocacy program. They've already uh, published a lot of these. I'll post the link also later. There's a slide uh, so you can get to those videos if you want to know more about the individual features we're hitting on today. So be sure to check out uh, devlink.sn slash Utah as well. And with that, uh, we'll get into introductions. Um, as I said, I am in Germany. My name is Lisa Hohenstein. I am a product outbound, outbound product manager. We're in the NOW platform. I focus mainly on workflow automation, that is flow designer, process automation designer, decision builder, and all those good things. And with me today, I have John and Jared. John, why don't you give a short introduction to yourself? Hey, I'm John Lind. Uh, I am in Denver, Colorado, USA, um, and I am a product success manager. I specialize in UI Builder and Next Experience, and I'm a, pretty much a lifelong developer, um, but I, I love all the different things that this platform can do, so I look forward to sharing a few of those things with you today. That's amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Jared. Hey, and I'm Jared Munt, I'm also on the team with John uh, in product success, focusing on the platform. Uh, and data protection products. Uh, been on the platform about nine years and also um, glad that we have another release to share with you today. Yes, new releases are always exciting. All right, uh, with that, um, well, this one's not necessarily uh, important today because we are speaking about uh, things that are generally available, but if we may hint at something that comes in the Vancouver or later release, just to be sure you don't make any purchasing decisions based on that. Uh, and before we get into the uh, meat of our session, uh, this is part of a larger set of series, a uh, set of academy series. We have other webinars and meetups that we go to as product managers. I would love for you to um, check these out, uh, get this link, uh, find out where to go. We have so many more academies in our lineup. My colleagues are talking and teaching about uh, mobile apps, about virtual agent, uh, other conversational interface topics, next experience, of course, uh, and all those good other topics. I'll have a, another slide at the end so you can sign up for all the other uh, academies and look at their um, recorded sessions. So workflow automation, near and dear to my heart, is my very favorite uh, product on the platform because we're a workflow company and our uh, products all run with workflows. So we uh, are very happy to improve on the workflow automation products all the time. As you can see on this slide, it's not just flows. There is actually a huge variety of workflow um, products that we have. We show you digital process automation in your uh, playbooks in a workspace. We have um, flow designer process automation. There's decision management. We have the flow engine and of course, approvals and all kinds of other beautiful things. We will talk about playbooks, flow designer, process automation and decision builder today. 
So speaking of flow designer and diagramming, uh, one new feature in flow designer is that in Utah, you can now convert actions to subflows. This is so, so handy if you started creating your workflows in flow designer. And at some point they just, sometimes they just get really complex and they get really large. And you find that you would like to compartmentalize your flows or even reuse certain sections in other logic, in other processes. This is specifically true for, say, catalog fulfillment or um, if you're talking about certain um, other processes where you find the kind of approval is always the same. You go to the manager, then you go to the manager's manager. You will want to uh, put that in a subflow. With Utah, this is much easier than it was before. You can, um, in your uh, flow, next to the actions, there's a select multiple link. If you click on that, those beautiful checkboxes will show up, and then you can go and convert that into a subflow. The cool part about this feature is that it not just takes all of the inputs, all of the data pills that are in those steps and converts them into subflow inputs, but it creates the subflow and hooks the created subflow back into your existing flow. So you, all nice. you have to do is publish your flow and you're done. It's amazing. One of, I'm, I have to say, this is really one of my favorite features that was ever added to Flow Designer. <laughs> That's a big one. It saves you all that time forklifting, copying, bringing up two screens, remembering what you did in the other version. <laughs> yes, yes, absolutely. You can just make your things much uh, reusable much more easily. This is awesome. So next up, we'll have a lot of topics to go through today. Uh, flow diagramming. Flow diagramming was introduced a couple of releases ago. I'm not quite sure. I think it was like San Diego, Rome, probably. And by and by, over the past uh, couple of releases, we have added more features to make the process diagramming view fully on par with the, let's call it natural language or linear flow view that you're all used to. Uh, we are creating this in order to make everybody more comfortable on Flow Designer because we got a lot of feedback from you, from our customers, from our partners, that the move from workflow editor to Flow Designer is sometimes a little hard. If you don't have the visual representation, you don't know where the path is going, where is it continuing? And flow diagramming makes that much, much easier. And it now also supports uh, flow stages. And I think we'll see that in a later uh, in a later later uh, slide two uh, decisions. So that is very, very exciting. Uh, we're almost 100% uh, on par. I think we're aiming for Vancouver to get the last details. I like the linear view, though, because I spent all my time in workflows trying to keep the lines from crossing and I'm not actually working on the process. That was that was like 80 percent of my time. Yeah, I, I, I feel that I feel that deeply, the, the <laughs> crossing the lines. The, the awesome part about flow diagramming is you don't have to do that. It does right. it for you. It auto arranges your process for you. So this is the other feature that I just mentioned, really amazing. You can now uh, see and switch to diagramming view if your flow contains a decision, which is really, really handy if you want to understand what happens for different decisions that you make. And decision in that case, of course, refers to our decision builder decision tables. And one more cool feature that you can maybe uh, see a little bit is there's now a print function which is so, so handy because how often did you um, uh, have somebody who asked you, hey, can you can you export that flow into a diagram? I need it for my pro process documentation. And that is not possible. You can have a fully printable version of that uh, diagram, export that to PDF, and then just attach to your process documentation. I think that's very, very cool. And you can find that from uh, if you're in diagram view and you have that mini uh, view on the bottom left, that that is where you will find the print button. So many great uh, improvements for flow diagramming. One more thing uh, for flow designer on the um, action designer. 
very exciting feature uh, that helps your developers, helps you to keep in mind where your uh, flows, flow actions are being used. So a new feature currently in Action Designer is that when you publish an action, changes to an action, you will get a pop-up that tells you what are all the flows, what are all the subflows that this action is being used in. You can also get to it if you click on the uh, three dots in the top right corner of your action designer. You can open that even before you publish, but um, you will get a warning and you will also be notified if there are any rows that are hidden by security constraints. So it might be that your action is used in flows that you cannot see, but you will still get the notification that it is used and where it's used. So this will help you a lot and help you identify these collisions that may happen. Seeing a comment in chat, yes, always asking for diagrams, absolutely. I think that's um, exporting, printing the diagram is, is so helpful. Because then you can just like hand it over and say, hey, is this how your process is going, is supposed to be working, right? The, this is the last one for me for this part. Um, currently, just a side note, this is currently not yet available from Flow Designer itself. Um, I'm pretty sure safe harbor and all that we will be making this available from the design space um, as soon as we can. Um, but you can get to it from uh, the backend. So if you navigate to in your uh, navigator, you go to process automation, go to flow administration and settings, you will see a list of all your, uh, all your flows. Uh, you can then add the column flow priority to that list and change it. Per default, um, all of your flows that you created are set to medium. Uh, you can set them to low or to high. The cool part about this is that um, the execution will change by, say, buckets of priority. It's not quite like we used or used to with the order number in, in, uh, in business rules or inbound actions but a little more flexible. Those are big buckets. Use high for high business value, very important things like emergency emergency um, cases or uh, cases where very urgent um, uh, action is needed, put those on high. Anything that is absolutely not time sensitive, put those on low. One note, uh, the pausing of flows will occur between actions. So we will never pause in the middle of, a, of an action execution. It will also always only be between actions. And it's not 100%. So if you run, say, 10 high, 10 medium, and 10 uh, low priority flows, it will not run all of the highs first, all of the medium next, but it'll like prioritize the, the high. There will be some mediums, some high, then we'll have a bunch of mediums, we'll have some lows, and then the rest of the lows. So it's not 100%, it's not a def definitive order, but it will, um, it will uh, prioritize them and make sure that the high priority ones run with more priority, I guess. <laughs> All right. We have some questions on this. Yes. So um, let me get these real quick. Uh, will Flow Association show you if others are using your public flows that you have exposed for others to use? You, currently, this is working only for flow actions. Um, and you can see where these flow actions are being used. We're working on uh, making this available for, say, subflows, but that's not yet available. That is that part. So currently it's just flow actions. Um, for flow priorities, uh, yes, those are subjective. That's why we made sure, <laughs> I think that's one of the reasons why we didn't do like order numbers, like specific order numbers. We'll really, um, the majority of your flows will really be in the medium bucket. I would make, um, I would make it a process to define or maybe have some counsel or something to make sure that high is really just the business critical, the emergency ones, the security incidents, the really, really important ones, those should be high. Right. Yeah, those notifications that need to cut in line and just go out the door immediately. Yes. If there's, um, there was one example in uh, the creator toolbox the other day 
about the um, flow improvements in Utah. Um, that is, if you're, a, say, a manufacturing site and you have a conveyor belt accident and somebody is in danger and you immediately need your um, site emergency services, that would be a high business value, high critical flow. Um, and then one last question, is flow diagram functionality, functionality available for subflows as well? Not just yet. So this is another safe harbor. Uh, we're working on it. I can't commit to when it will make in, it into the product, but it's definitely something that that is on our mind. We want full parity between flows and, and in flow diagramming. Absolutely. Cool. So with that, I will hand it over to John. Thank you so much. Thank you for the questions. Those are awesome. Keep them coming. Sure thing. Thank you. And uh, so this first one, um, I think is important because um, it kind of is supporting the um, some of the design and kind of the dream of having a decision builder being a tool that's usable by, um, uh, by like business users, right? Um, and so uh, before there were some quirks in the security rules in terms of who could safely edit decisions without uh, or safely edit uh, decisions in decision builder um, with what security and stuff, right? Because you kind of you kind of had to use higher security than than you might preferred. So we've added a couple of roles to help uh, uh, allow you to, uh, um, to 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 turn this over to potentially non-developer users. So I think that's pretty important and it was part of the original vision and, and this helps really fix that. Right. Uh, just to make uh, to make the quick connection, the rule author uh, would be allowed to see if I can create a square. Yes, that looks good. So the rule author would be allowed to work on this whole part. Um, they would see the inputs but couldn't edit them, but they could work on the whole table. The, um, let me pick another color. The result editor would only be able to work on the results. Right. Nice. Yeah, so this one, uh, I think this is one of the first things probably a lot of us developers when we first saw Decision Builder were like, wait, 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 wait. <laughs> I, know how, I know how logic works and uh, I think you might've missed something here, but uh, the default result is great. Um, uh, sort of the else case. Uh, so, um, super handy um and this makes it a lot simpler to implement that um uh, you do uh you can you can just basically turn on the default results option and, and that line will appear so it's very nice right that's awesome the cool part is this is also available when called by api so if you use the decisions uh, through the api you can also get that one as a as a default result more yeah, speaking, builder. <laughs> speaking of APIs, so um, this is cool. So I was looking to, if you'll, you'll notice on the documentation that the uh, decision table API is uh, much, much more substantial than it was in previous versions. So um, it, it seems like you could build pretty much any sort of decision, uh, build anything you wanted pretty much using those APIs, which is really nice. Um, and you don't have to like dive in and start trying to mess with the tables directly and that kind of thing. Um, so Lisa, what kind of a, what do you think are some good examples of how, uh, how this might be implemented or used uh, in kind of a, in a business scenario? Sure. Um, so maybe uh, you all have already seen the decision table imp uh, import export uh, option. So you can uh -huh. uh, import and export, uh, you can export a decision table to an Excel sheet send that over to the business owner who owns these decisions, they fill it out and they can import it again. However, uh, this may be happening in a different system and maybe you want to integrate your decisions with a different system and you want to make that available through the API. That could be one option. Or you have a, a service catalog item to add a decision row to a decision. So you would, might want to have some approval in between adding a new uh, decision row and the result. So if you want to have a, 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 a rule between there, an approval between there, you might want to use the API to add another row into this. Nice. Yeah, so process automation designer, I, um, I, like, I really like this product and it's been really 
fun to see how much this has evolved over the last couple of years. Um, the, uh, it was one of the first products I worked with when I first joined ServiceNow back in the Paris timeframe. And, um, it was a little, was, you know, like a lot of initial products was a little, it was a little, uh, uh, it was pretty simple at the time, uh, in terms of like its capabilities and, and a little, a little more complex to use, but, um, this is a really nice one, real common request. There was a ways to do it. You could kind of build some custom stuff to do this before. But now you can add optional activities right to the screen. And there's a little, uh, as you'll see, there's a little choice at the top if you want to add optional activities. Real common situation, right? You uh, we get this ask list a lot. Hey, the agent's going through, they're doing their thing, they're following the playbook, but then they just need to do something that's just different, right? Uh, and they don't want to have to jump back out to the to the to the to the UI and you know go create a new record or whatever type they know that they need, for example, or um, there may be just, again, just specific parts of the process that are just nice to have extra information that may or may not exist, that type of thing. So all those options you can now um, just integrate directly into the process automation designer, which is which is really nice. Yeah, the, I mean, the only thing that we can rely on for processes is that they never go according to plan. So right. having the possibility to add something at runtime is super helpful. Yeah, it was a really popular request. So I'm glad that uh, they did a great job adding it in there. And these are, uh, so once you added them to this uh, interface here, either on the lane or on the process, uh, on the global uh, side, uh, they'll be available on the playbook as well. So from each of the lanes or from the playbook uh, actions, you can then add the uh, optional activities to your uh, execution, playbook execution. That's right, that's right. Uh, another thing is, uh, you know, someone for whom UI Builder and uh, uh, is near and dear to my heart. Um, uh, I was, they've done a really, really good job of breaking the playbook into uh, um, what we kind of internally call the model. The old monolithic playbook component was was kind of limited, um, and uh, so you couldn't do a lot of customization to it. They did a really good job in Utah now that they've broken it into basically its component pieces. Right as you can see here on this example from UI Builder. Um, if you decide that you want to lay it out differently, if you want to put, you know, the stage picker in a different place, or, you know, you want to move, you know, the modal, or, you know, or move the um, activity viewer. Um, and those are also configurable as well to be like uh, horizontal or vertical. Um, and so you can basically build whatever you'd like in terms of layouts for a playbook um, in your, uh, in UI Builder. And the other nice thing too is all of the data for the playbook, uh, um, is available in the controller. And that means there are things that you, if you want to take over control and you know get rid of the playbook picker and do it your, your own way, right? You want to do it with pills or something, right? You got you have access to that data and then you could then you know add a different uh, component to the screen and bind that data directly to it, which is really nice. That'll make this a really flexible and, and uh, way of, of presenting playbooks. And, and also another nice thing too is that in UI Builder, if you create a new page, there's now four templates. So there's like a horizontal and a vertical and a couple of different versions of it. Um, so it's really, really, really handy to be able oh, to, if you cool. need to create a playbook page, that you can get straight to it using a template. I didn't know there were templates. That's amazing. That's cool. Yeah. And then um, could you take a theme builder and some variants and then totally make your colors exactly, uh, you know, to the next level um, for your org too? Oh yeah, for sure. For sure. Yeah. It's, so it's one cool thing nice about uh, playbook, uh, the playbook um, page is in, so there is a new edition. Uh, I think it belongs to App Engine Studio and that's called Workspace Builder. And in Workspace Builder, if you go to the record page for your custom app, you can just check a box and it adds the playbook tab to your record page and does all the hooking up of the data and the controller and everything right. for you. That is right. pretty handy. Yep, very nice. Awesome. All right, I think, uh, let me check the questions. I so, so Marco, yeah, so your question on individual fields, right? So you can definitely, the most straightforward thing, obviously in, in, uh, in, a, in a process automation designer is to dynamically and, and show and hide sections. Um, and uh, you can switch views, you can do things like that. Um, I'm not sure, I'm not sure using the standard, the standard uh, process automation designer components, 
how you do a per field basis um, based on previous selection values. Um, unless Lisa, do you do you know of a way to do that uh, offhand? Um, so one one thing that I could see is if the values you choose up pre previously, if they are being handed out through uh, activity outputs, then you could have multiple activities that are following uh, right. show conditionally. So if the yeah. value is handed over through the process and you have the data builds, you can uh, show lanes or activities uh, conditionally based on which right. uh, which data. And has another thing you could do is you could actually switch views as well, possibly. Yeah. So if you want to have a different view for the different scenarios, that might be yeah. an option. If I'm perform. not sure you can uh, change, switch the playbook layout dynamically. I don't think that works, but you may have different form views in different activities based on uh, conditions. Right. Right. Cool. Jared, you're ready? Yeah. Yeah. Before I get started, um, I didn't want to interrupt you earlier, but both of you mentioned, hey, this feature wasn't in San Diego, but it's out here now. Um, what I heard is use the idea portal throw your features, if there's something like that, that would be really useful to you. Um, the idea portal has moved over into the support instance. So uh, if, you, if you're looking at even what we have in Utah and there's still something that could be better, please throw it in there. We have a bunch of uh, categories and classifications for your idea so it can get to the right people. And I just uh, didn't want to, you, you were on a roll earlier, but I did want to plug that uh, for all of our product managers. Uh, and you're right, Jared. And for the UIB next experience, I will see 100% of those, and I will make sure that your uh, that your idea is heard. We can't necessarily well necessarily implement it, but I will make sure that you're heard and we'll evaluate it, and, and we'll get back to you. Great. And so every release in recent history has had some pretty good um, investment into our security, privacy, and identity products. So you know, Safe Harbor. I can't comment on what's coming in the next three releases, but um, the most, you know, the, the previous three releases have had more than the three releases before that. And so let's talk about what is specifically in Utah today. Uh, all of these products I'll look at don't have any additional licensing impacts for you. They're all part of your core platform license. Uh, the first one is this KMF health page. So the uh, KMF health page is not new. It, it came out, I think, in... I don't know, uh, Rome or San Diego even, but uh, we've added some extra features onto the page to proactively and auto help automatically resolve some of the common errors. And so it will, um, it, if you're not aware, the key management framework uh, components are split between your instance and a hardware security module in the data center. So there's been a bit of kind of a lack of transparency about how things are configured because of that. And so the, the new and improved KMF health page actually will do more, do more transparency, uh, will reduce the amount of time you need to have a, a support ticket open. And uh, yeah, so with, with that new property can actually um, help give you just automated, uh, automated or direct links to KB articles on what's going on with your instance. So that's, hey, that's a great improvement in Utah. Jared, can you indulge my ignorance? <laughs> can you give me a very easy explanation of what key management is in this case? What does it do for me? So all of, or maybe not all, but most of the security products these days are uh, tying back to the KMF. So it helps, uh, it does a few things. It helps us um, reduce what the platform admin uh, the admin role and the security admin roles, what they have access to in your instance. So we have uh, products like uh, cloud encryption, column level encryption, secrets management, uh, code signing. I, I, I know there's a bunch of products that use that. And so in the case of secrets management, which has a core uh, free feature, and then there's secrets management enterprise that's part of the vault uh, suite license, which is a, a premium security product. But even in the even in the core version, it will let you set up secrets groups. So 
before, uh, the platform admin could run a simple background script and say, hey, decrypt you know, this password to field. Now with secrets management relying on the KMF, it says, wait a minute, I'm gonna I'm gonna do some extra checking before ah. I deep to this for you. So awesome. uh yeah, it's it's security. <laughs> it's great. Yeah, it's 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 definitely a big part of the evolution uh of of what we, you know, five, 10 years ago, admin could do everything. Now <laughs> yes. uh oh, yes. we we've we've gone into scoped apps, we've we've split off, you know, the the HR. Yeah. scoped app admin, the customer service management, the security incident response scoped admin. And so now this is um, kind of going into that same realm within your password two files, your uh, your secrets for your different discovery jobs. So I won't do a, uh, yeah, won't go deep dive into KMF, but that's that gives you a little taste of all the different systems that, are, that, it, uh, that it supports. Right. There's one question directly for this. Would this allow us to better or more securely manage OAuth secrets with ServiceNow versus uh, Azure AD? So not the KMF directly, but the secrets management core plugin that I that I threw out. Uh, whether you're using the free uh, secrets management core or you have a Vault suite license, which gives you uh, a handful of, of privacy, security, identity, encryption, products. Um, yes, that will help you limit who has access to those credentials for your external integrations. Awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah. And then next up is going to be the Identity Center. That is a brand new uh, version one plugin that is available now in Utah. And so for uh, this will be especially useful for certain organizations that maybe have some higher audit and governance requirements. This gives the administrator the ability to go into a particular user uh, in the sys user table, and there's an extra UI action at the bottom of the page, which will load up the dashboard specifically for the selected user. And we see a screenshot of it here. It shows a little bit about uh, the history of that user's login, which if they have a mobile device registered and then uh, things like the session ID, uh, browser details. So, if it, so for whether it's troubleshooting or whether it's just getting additional information uh, about who's logging into your system, uh, this is, like I said, this is the the first iteration of this. Uh, and then uh, that that session ID is is especially useful uh, when looking into the the transaction logs and and seeing uh, why is this page taking. 600 milliseconds to render or you know whatever you happen to be troubleshooting at the time that sounds really uh, handy uh and then we do have a question pop up from the chat will identity identity center also capture when support logs if we have the snc plugin the snack uh service now access plugin enabled i'm not 100 percent sure um i believe it would uh, i I need to double check on how those support accounts are actually inserted into the sys user table uh, and also uh, how they remain in the sys user table after the support action is done. Uh, but depending on how that is, it's it's possible this will help you there too. All right. So we'll check back, check on that and and come back to you. Awesome. Yes. So this is, yeah, this is fairly straightforward. Um, it's just a, a simple plugin. It does not get activated automatically when you upgrade to Utah, but it is available for you, um, again, uh, as part of your platform license, uh, no cost, when you upgrade to Utah. We love nice. to hear that. <laughs> All right. Next up is a really cool feature. Um, you've probably seen on some other what's new in Utah types of of uh, content about the Integration Hub's Stream Connect uh, edition. It's a Kafka compatible near real time streaming data where you can get data into your instance um, and then process it within all the different Integration Hub tools. So, Log Export Service is the reverse of that. It lets you get near real time data out of your instance and into your other centralized log management systems. So, uh, we throw Splunk because that's one of the more popular ones, but it's really any Kafka compatible 
um, logging system, um, we can enable this plugin. Um, I do have the dollar sign up in the top right because uh, the starter tier does give you up to, uh, as of the time of this recording, 500 gigabytes per month uh, of log data. If you go beyond that, there are some a couple of tiers, including an unlimited tier with our vault suite. But um, yeah, it so node logs, which have traditionally been really hard to get data out of, uh, can now be real uh, near real time streamed out into your the, the same thing where your org is logging all the rest of its data uh, for network defense, for uh, governance, and just logging purposes. And there's some thresholds, uh, so you don't have to export everything. Um, for example, in the node logs, if you only want to send out warning and errors, uh, transaction logs, if you want to send everything, um, that will, yeah, it's it's configurable. And as of uh, Utah, the the five options listed on the screen are what you can select from uh, node logs, the syslog, the audit table, transaction, and the outbound HTTP uh, logs. And the screenshots, it's a very it's a very simple interface within ServiceNow. So I didn't put the ServiceNow configuration page. I threw a couple of uh, vendor, you know, third-party systems, what it looks like on the other side when things are coming in uh, into those remote systems. So uh, let's see, we got a couple questions. Thank you for yes. thank you for posting those into the QA panel. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure about the track active sessions. Uh, I, if we're talking about the identity center, then then uh, I do believe yes, it is it is across all of the the nodes and not just the current node. All right, and if you've heard me talk on other content, uh, you know that I love multi-factor authentication. I'm always telling people to turn it on for yeah. their break glass accounts, their backup accounts, any local accounts. And then also within your SSO, configure it on the SSO side, um, especially for the, the um, yeah, especially for administrators. But really, it's it should be everyone these days uh, with uh, uh, business email compromise and the other common attack vectors that are floating around out in the world. And so within Utah, we have a couple of extra options for you. So back in San Diego, we only had one. Uh, this is for local login. Your SSO providers may have a, a variety of different ones, but if you're using these ServiceNow local logins uh, in San Diego, you only had, and, and prior, you only had one option, that Google Authenticator compatible app that you had to install, which for a, a ServiceNow administrator, probably not that big of a deal, but for business users out in the field, um, everyone across your org, that was kind of a kind of a bigger ask. Uh, so in Tokyo, um, we quietly added a FIDO to security key plugin. So that is um, that was new as of Tokyo, still available. So check your plugins for web authentication, uh, FIDO2. And now that gives you two options. Now in Utah, we have two additional options. Uh, so you can enable uh, multi-factor authentication, but not necessarily... Uh, cause a lot of friction on your end users. So we get to uh, generate a, um, a verification code and send it to their registered email address or their registered mobile device uh, via SMS. And so that is uh, now available. It, it does not use the email to SMS like traditionally the instance did behind the scenes. It does require a, an SMS gateway uh, API plugin. Uh, there are some sample. Uh, I, I forget the. Uh, I forget which ones are are the out of box configured ones, um, but there are a few uh, example ones built in for you. And so now uh, you can get all the benefits of SMS or, or one time passwords and multi factor for your users. And. Um, and then there's a couple of questions coming in, but they kind of tie to the next slide as well. So let's let's take care of the next uh, final slide, and then we'll swing back to some of these questions. Uh, 
This is probably the one that, that I think is the coolest as a as, as someone who's done a bunch of hackathons and um, extending of the ServiceNow authentication methods in the past. This one is a another new plugin um, a, that will give you the option to generate just a, a single time-limited authentication password. So think of those uh, users out in the field that rarely log into the platform, maybe once every six months, maybe once a year, um, or, or any really any business system. Uh, that usually in, uh, incurs a password reset process before they log in to go do the they you know the two minutes worth of work they need to do on the platform. So this skips all that hassle and can generate just a, a time limited password that will let them log into the system, get their work done, but does not uh, actually change your official sys user password. It is a, it is a, a separate time limited uh, password and. Uh, the screenshot here, I chose to uh, include a picture of the script include that ships with the plugin because, again, it's a this is this is not part of the low code pack. This is a uh, development pack. You're you're modifying authentication. Uh, it's it's something that needs to be done with a lot of review. So be careful when you're implementing this. But um, this is a new new core API that's available in this space. And it does pair really well with the adaptive authentication. So you can specify some rules and say, if, if you're on the, uh, if you're logging in from the corporate network, um, yes, just I will email you your temporary password and log in, no extra steps required. If I'm logging in outside of the network, um, you can use the time limited password, but then you also need to do the second maybe the SMS one-time password, uh, it's, or even if um, even restrict this and say, if you are an admin or a security admin, you are not eligible to use the time-limited password. Only if you are a CSM external user or you are part of the, uh, the SNC external role or whatever, you know, the, the adaptive auth is very flexible um, for, for governing that type of thing. So um, I'm looking forward to seeing this plugin more in use, uh, especially if you're going to uh, Knowledge23 and participating in the hackathon and you want other people to be able to log on to your instance to test out your app, um, you'll, be, you'll be able to use this plugin and, and let them kind of self-register and log in. So that's a couple minutes on those tools. Uh, Thank you. And... And yeah, it looks like we have a couple questions. Um, first of all, yes, the uh, one of the out of box SMS uh, API connections is Twilio. Uh, that was the that's the big one that I that I couldn't think of earlier. <laughs> um, if we are using SSO uh, single sign on, is it possible to bypass SSO for mobile users? Um, probably. That, that's that's in Tokyo. There's a, a trusted mobile device part of adaptive authentication um, that may get you what you're looking for there, but it, a lot of nuance to uh, to mobile authentication. So uh, I would say take a look at the, the trusted mobile device registration part of adaptive authentication that came out in Tokyo for that. Awesome. Uh, can multi-factor authentication be leveraged if you are leveraging multi-SSO on one and not the other. I believe yes is the answer. And that is going to be within the adaptive authentication. You're gonna have uh, pre-processing and post-processing. Uh, so that would be, a, you'll be able to do a post-process uh, step up rule, uh, which is what it'd be. And, and you'd be able to step up and add MFA for, uh, for a subset of users. So knowledge management, we have a couple of improvements on knowledge management and also service portal. Uh, one of them is you're probably all aware that uh, the service portal is currently still in service portal technology and will be for a bit. So we're not quite yet um, migrating to um, the now design system for that part yet. So not not um, next experience on the portal pages or the knowledge uh 
portal. However, we want our themes to be in line with each other. So there are now next experience type themes for the KB, CSM, and consumer portals. Uh, we'll also have next experience theming for knowledge articles on mobile and similar for knowledge pages in classic environment. Uh, for now, um, there's only light mode supported uh, in portal and mobile. A uh, uh, cool new feature, really, really useful new feature for uh, service portal in general, but also uh, the knowledge portal is that we can now have human readable URL support for these pages. So it's not just the, the part we know with having the KB sys ID and the whole long uh, string that nobody can read, but you can configure human readable URLs now. Um, these will help you enhance your SEO rankings. Um, there's a property you have to activate to get that um, uh, to to get that option, but then you will have the possibility to, for example, have a URL like catalog category and then the item name or article category and then the article title, uh, as opposed to having that just the catalog item ID in the URL. So this is a really, really cool new feature, and we're we're happy to bring this to you and hope that makes your uh, portal admin life a bit easier. Uh, speaking of service portal, uh, we have some updates um, for uh, for this as well. Uh, for service portal, we have uh, an enhancements for the sitemap generator. So uh, this store application was enhanced to um, help you include custom content when generating sitemaps which I think is really, really handy. I mean, sitemaps are always useful if you go to a page and you quickly want to navigate around. Um, this is a really, really handy new feature. All right, uh, so this is amazing. I, I really love these enhancements. And this also goes to show that we're not abandoning a service portal just yet. It's a fully supported product and we're making enhancements. And uh, at the same time, we're working on uh, our configurable workspaces to bring the next experience and, and then um, new uh, experience on the core UI uh, for you as well. And then lastly, we have a couple of Michelani's topics and I pronounced the, the word right. I'm so proud of myself. <laughs> it's a hard right word, <laughs> especially if you're not a native speaker. It is hard. Uh, I'll hand it over. Who takes the script editor? I think Jared, right? Yeah, yeah, we, we've changed a bit behind the scenes. Um, I, I, I don't know if Script Editor is its own product or not, but uh, it, when you're upgrade to Utah and look at any business rule or script include, um, it's now using the same script editor that uh, is used in the Flow Designer script portion. And also, uh, this looks familiar if you've used uh, VS Code um, or or any of the other major uh, editors, where you'll be able to spot your your warnings and your errors um, over in the the minified text in the right bar. And uh, I think that's so the Monaco. The Monaco text editor is so basically the the JavaScript version of uh, VS Code. And also, I don't know if you can all see that, um, there are small chevrons over here next to the line numbers. So this yep. is where you can collapse and expand sections of your code to make it more readable. So that's, I think that's new too. I, yeah, that's that was possible before, but it took more clicks <laughs> um, in the previous editor. Uh, and I think the the other things, the, the breakpoints and things like that, um, is is similar um, functionality to before, so it's it's all it's all additive. It's just I think it's cool to to call out uh, this particular feature. Oh, we got a nice note in the Q and A panel. They also fixed macros, so the cursor will move to the placement defined in the macro. That is awesome. That sounds really handy. I love macros. The big one is if you do like a var gr, it'll then insert the code right inside the, the text blocks instead of just having to you know navigate back up so very nice right and puts your cursor right in the table name field whereas it it tried right. to do it before it just couldn't quite make it <laughs> 
Awesome. And then this is building on a really cool feature that was in Tokyo, where we are not tied to ES5 anymore. Um, so modern server side uh, JavaScript is an option. Uh, in Tokyo, it was an opt-in, uh, but now we, we need to call out in Utah that when you create a new scoped application, the default JavaScript mode is our JS21, uh, the ES6 plus model. So um, you don't have to remember to go back and turn it on if you're going to use the, the lets and the arrow functions and the various other things that were notably missing from the ES5 world. This was the best day of my life. Uh, the second best day of my life was when they switched to ES5 and I thought in Helsinki, I'm like, this is great. We're going to keep upgrading. So now we're finally <laughs> upgrading. This is awesome. We have a few more questions. Uh, one of them is around uh, service portal and configurable workspaces. So uh, one thing of note here, we're not deprecating service portal at the moment. So we're not replacing service portal with um, uh, next experience pages just now. Uh, so for now, you can keep your service portals as they are. Uh, they are also the front end part of the platform. Configurable workspaces are designed to be used by your agents um, and your fulfillers. So it's not quite the same persona uh, that would use a service portal or a workspace. So you and can absolutely start using configurable workspaces for your different products. Um, if you want more info on that, uh, you can look for the Next Experience Center of Excellence on the Now community. I don't have the link handy just now, but we'll get it to you. Uh, there's a bunch of articles, uh, Q&A, FAQ posts there that go into detail about the where, the when, the what, and the how about Next Experience. So for the translation, uh, Ramiro, check the uh, previous uh, academies that we had. We did one with um, our colleague from the internationalization team uh, a, while, a short while ago about um, different options for translating um, notifications and everything. So we've had a, an academy around this. All right. Um, so. I think we have made it through all of the topics. As I promised to you, uh, there's a whole lot more content on the developer uh, site. The developer uh, program uh, site, they have done creator toolbox sessions, live coding happy hours, and all kinds of other great content about all of the new features in Utah. We haven't even covered all of the platform products because there are just so many. Um, there are more improvements to other products like ATF or CICD. Um, make sure to check out the release notes for all of the products that are relevant to you. You can upgrade your PDIs to Utah now and, and test everything. We did a great session about upgrades, uh, upgrade plans, um, and how to do upgrades in the in the previous academy sessions. So be sure to check those out as well. If you're looking for more academy sessions, here are the short links uh, to all of our amazing academies. As I said, we have one about uh, mobile, about conversational interface that is including virtual agent. We have mo um, platform analytics. We have AI, next experience, a lot of great content on those uh, academies as well. So make sure to, uh, to check those out. And as every time, I thank you very much. Thank you, John and Jared and Eliza for joining me today. This was an amazing session. Uh, thank you everybody for joining us from our participants. It's very cool to see you all here, have returning faces and uh, see you again, joining us again. I'm very, very happy that all of you are joining us. I hope you join us again in two weeks. Um, the 
current plan is that the next session in two weeks will be covering uh, decision builder improvements in the past couple of uh, sessions. We'll have the product owner, Julia Perlis, join us again. So that will be a very exciting session. We'll have maybe get some some in-depth and and live demo for the for this product. It's very exciting. I love it. I love, love it a lot. Thank you again. Uh, see you in two weeks. Have a great time. Bye-bye. Yeah. Auf Wiedersehen.